On Peleliu and the Palau group of the Caroline Islands, Leathernecks of the 1st Marine Division continue to meet stubborn Jap resistance. Elements of Major General Paul J. Mueller's 81st Division push east from the coast. On 25th September, Marines follow up the Army advance by storming the Jap radio station near the northwestern tip of the island. This elaborate radio installation was the last means of communication between the Japanese defenders in the north and those holding out on our left flank in the pillboxes and caves of Umar Brogel Mountain. Marines bring forward ammo and 37mm guns. Doberman pinchers selected for their exceptional agility and speed join in the slow task of eliminating isolated pockets of resistance as organized defense disintegrates. Bullets and flame, armored Amtraks probe the jungle for snipers. By 26 September, with Marines and Army troops continuing to storm hill positions, the Japs are driven into two pockets, one at the northeast tip of the island, the other at the southern extremity of Umar Brogo Mountain nicknamed Bloody Nose Ridge. A Jap exposes himself to hurl a yardstick mine. Demolition men prepare a high explosive charge to seal Japs in a hillside cave from which they refuse to emerge. A fixed charge is made ready to neutralize another point of stubborn Jap resistance. In a regrouping of forces, elements of the 81st move up to relieve men of Major General William H. Rupertus, 1st Marine Division, who'd been in contact with the enemy for 48 consecutive hours. After one night's rest, the Marines returned to battle, negotiating terrain which they called Death Valley and Shooting Gallery Ridge. On 27 September, Marines break through to the northern tip of Peleliu. The attack and occupation phases of operations against Peleliu and Angar are not to be considered at an end until 13th October, with mopping up of isolated Japs continuing. Marine Amtraks patrol the boat channel north of Peleliu on 24th September. They are investigating 10 Jap barges loaded with reinforcements which had been sunk or damaged by naval gunfire the night before. A survivor tries a getaway. boarding a wrecked barge which had drifted inshore. A damaged landing craft is attacked. Surviving Japs return machine gun fire. The Jap treads water as the marine dragnet nears. Taken prisoner, the Jap is restrained for interrogation.
Another Jap is hauled in. Meanwhile, on nearby Angaur, even before the island is secured, aviation engineers move in equipment to begin construction of an airstrip. They'll have to contend with thick jungle, debris, and snipers. The clearing begins. Dugouts must be demolished. Tree stumps uprooted on the runway site. locating one end of a center line for the strip. Small strips are cleared at right angles to the center line. Then the intervening terrain is cleared gradually. On D plus six, progress is being made. Most of Angaur seems to be porous coral rock. Crevices are matted with tropical vegetation. A sheep's foot roller packs down the ground. The Angaur airstrip nears completion for use against remaining Jap strongholds in the Palau's. Bitumen, a specially treated paper for surfacing runways. These Royal Canadian Air Force films show rolls of prefabricated bitumen surface being carried to a runway converted from a wheat field somewhere in France. An airfield surfacing machine puts down the first strip. Engineers call this machine a stamp licker. The machine was invented by Captain G.E. Humphreys of the Royal Canadian Engineers. The Royal Air Force made the first successful use of bitumen on runways in England. Later, Americans adopted the process. As the surfacing machine finishes its job, rollers begin ironing out the strips of bitumen. All traces of a wheat field are gone in 14 hours, record surfacing time by Canadian engineers. Aachen, Germany, gateway to the Rhineland, is in ruins 18th October following Nazi rejection of the American ultimatum. A self-propelled 155 millimeter gun is brought into action. Point-blank fire is directed against one of the last German strong points. Remnants of the Nazi garrison of 1,500 troops fired 20 millimeter guns, sweeping the streets and raking nearby houses where Americans crouched, firing at the enemy. Armored elements pushed through the center of Aachen on the 19th. Infantrymen advance after wiping out Nazis in a bunker that was formerly an air raid shelter. These Americans, for the most part, learned their street fighting by three and a half months of practice in a section of an English town that had been ruined by German bombs in 1940. Resistance ends on the 20th after a fortnight of fighting for the city. German civilians on their way to a refuge outside the dead city. Some had taken cover in heavily fortified bunkers. 15,000 of a normal population of 160,000 remained behind during the final attack.
Aachen in ruins, sacrificed by the Germans to buy time. General Hodge's forces drive eastward, carrying with them the first major Allied victory on German soil. On 14th October, at a forward assembly area at Charmois, France, Japanese Americans of a combat team attached to a battle tried division prepare to leave for an attack on the Nazi-held city of Bruyere at the southern end of the Allied battle line. The unit is made up of American citizen volunteers of Japanese ancestry, veterans of the Italian campaign. These troops, many of them former members of the Hawaiian Territorial Guards, received their training at Camp Shelby, Mississippi. Arriving in the Bruyere sector, 40 miles north of the Belfort Gap. Troops continue to the front on foot. Attacking Bruyere. Falls, 19th October, opening the entrance to one of the main passes crossing the Vosges Mountains to the Rhine Plain. Another contingent of the Brazilian Expeditionary Force arrives at Naples, 9th October, to join Brazilian units engaging the enemy on the western coastal flank of General Mark Clark's 5th Army. These BEF troops more than double the size of the 1st Expeditionary Force. Boarding landing craft for shipment to another Tyrrhenian port. The new force includes artillery, infantry, and the 1st Brazilian Air Force contingent, complete with pilots and ground crews. Northward to the front, arrival of the new BEF coincides with the announcement that the Brazilians, fighting in some of the most difficult country on the entire Italian front, have captured Corelia, 26 miles northeast of Pisa. The new units are transported to a staging area within a few miles of the battle lines. Carrier-borne Air Force prepares for one of the series of strikes that soften up the Philippines for the Army's amphibious invasion. Since August 30th, when Admiral William F. Halsey's 3rd Fleet began operations in the Marianas, carrier planes have blasted Jap defenses, shipping, and air power throughout the archipelago. Dive bombers, torpedo planes, and strafers operate from the flight decks of the carriers with record speed. Possessed of great mobility through its accompanying supply and repair ships, the Carrier Task Force maintains an uninterrupted series of attacks. Carrier aircraft are credited with the destruction of 2,500 enemy planes in a two-month period. Our losses were approximately 300 carrier planes, making the ratio higher than 8 to 1. Plane handling crews buck the propeller blast as they move the aircraft into takeoff position. After receiving the takeoff signal, a fighter goes aloft. Other craft ride up the elevator from the hangar deck to the flight deck. Just as 
soon as the propeller wash of the plane ahead has been dissipated, the next member of the carrier squadron leaves the forward runway. attack. Target, Mindanao Island and vital shipping lanes at the southern end of the Philippines. In addition to the primary mission, the Mindanao strike tends further to confuse the enemy, who's never sure when and where an amphibious assault will follow the strafing and bombing forays. October, the attacks move into Japanese home waters. This time, the destinations for carrier aircraft to Vice Admiral Mark A. Mitchell's command are the Ryukyu Islands and Formosa. Targets, Japanese shipping and major military and naval installations. The Ryukyus guard the southern approaches to Japan proper and are important as staging and communication centers. Formosa, one of the most strongly fortified areas in the Japanese Empire, bars the lanes to the China coast. It protects Japan's lifeline between the homeland and her new colonial possessions to the south. The carrier planes blast these enemy bases through 10 days prior to the first landings in the Philippines. Our aircraft sight a U.S. submarine on regular patrol deep in Jap waters. The subs contributed to the mass destruction of enemy shipping. Hundreds of vessels were either sunk or damaged in the Ryukyu Formosa strikes. This is in addition to extensive damage to ground installations. Mission successfully accomplished, the planes returned to their carriers. Our losses have been light. In the Ryukyu's raids, they are known to have been 14 aircraft, and nine aircraft personnel. As the plane approaches the carrier's stern, wheels are down. So is the hook trailing from the tip of its tail. This hook is caught in the cable of the arresting gear, pulling the plane to a halt. Just forward of the last landing wire are the steel barriers, which prevent a plane that has missed the gear from racing down the deck toward the parked planes. The signal officer guides the landings. The large paddles he manipulates are the pilot's instructions as to what he must do to get the plane aboard safely. This means cut the gun and land. the deck, its landing gear gives way.
This time, the signal officer indicates to the pilot that he can't make it. The last of the carrier-borne aircraft return. They come in against a 25-knot wind, with the carrier moving away from them at about the same speed. The planes themselves land at something like 100 miles an hour. handling crews take over as the aircraft are berthed for routine checking and necessary repairs. The pilots report for interrogation. Down to the hangar deck to await the next order to launch planes. Meanwhile, far to the south, General MacArthur prepares to return at last to the Philippines. The general himself is in personal command of the invasion troops. He boards the light cruiser Nashville, on which he maintains his headquarters during the passage to the theater of operations. With General MacArthur are Lieutenant General Richard K. Sutherland, his chief of staff, and Lieutenant General George Kenney, commanding the Far Eastern Air Force. Units of Admiral William F. Halsey's 3rd Fleet and Vice Admiral Thomas C. Kincaid's 7th Fleet, supported by an Australian squadron, await the signal for the attack on Leyte Island in the Philippines. The invasion armada of at least 600 vessels is the largest ever assembled by the Allies in the Pacific. The move on Leyte has the element of surprise. According to General MacArthur, the enemy had anticipated landings on Mindanao, 300 miles to the south. A large number of U.S. battleships and Australian and U.S. cruisers and destroyers participate in the heavy preliminary bombardment of Leyte. before 10 hundred hours on the 20th, called A-Day. The major attacks are along the east coast between Tacloban, the capital of Leyte, and Dulag, 20 miles south. Leyte is the wasp waste of the Philippines. Eighth largest in the archipelago, it lies between the northern tip of Mindanao and the southern tip of Luzon. The defenders facing Lieutenant General Walter Kruger's Sixth Army are members of the 15th Japanese Division, which organized the March of Death for the captives of Bataan. MacArthur sets out for the Leyte beachhead a few hours behind the first assault waves. With him is Brigadier General Carlos Romulo. 
Being assisted into the barge is Serio Osmeña, who succeeded the late Manuel Quezon as president of the Philippine Commonwealth. One of the first functions of Osmeña's government will be to contact Filipino guerrilla leaders who have harried the Japs since the fall of Corregidor in May 1942. An historic moment in the history of the Philippines. General MacArthur wades ashore. The bitter days of Corregidor are two and a half years behind him. The road he followed back to the archipelago covered 2,500 miles from the southeastern tip of New Guinea where the offensive started nearly 16 months ago. General MacArthur's troops encountered only feeble resistance before fanning out to take initial objectives on Leyte. Forward elements are already within striking distance of Tacloban and the island's major airfields. The American columns move inland along an 18-mile front to a depth of four miles. Troops of Major General James N. Bradley's 96th Infantry Division outflank Dulag and capture the town and its adjacent airfield on the 21st. Natives return from the hills where they found safety during the height of the siege. Leyte has a population of 835,000. In ceremonies at the provincial capital building where President Osmania speaks, captured Tacloban becomes the temporary seat of the Philippine Commonwealth government. Thus, General MacArthur makes good his promise to return to the Philippines. Mm -hmm.